All praises to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everyone joining me on this program. This is the Fountain of Israel's Bible Studies program, and as always, it's an honor for me to stand before you on the Lord's holy Sabbath day. Now with that, we are not observing a regular Sabbath day. We are doing the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement. So before we get started, let me just go ahead and invite you guys to like, share, subscribe, smash that notification bell. And if you feel so inclined, check the description box down below so that if you do want to donate to the ministry because you are being fed, then you may do so by PayPal, Cash App, completely up to you. That being said, and that out of the way, let's jump right into our lesson. One of the, one of the things I love about our uh, lessons as far as uh, it's pertaining to the feast days is because it reveals the plan of salvation of the Most High Yah to mankind. And I think it's been a great injustice, right? Or a, a great misservice for when we when we went so many years, you know, some of us may have uh, come up in, you know, uh, you know, traditional Sunday Christianity and things like that. And we didn't, speaking for myself, we didn't learn a whole lot about, about the feast days, you know? And then when we do venture off and we go try to learn a little bit, a little something about the feast days, it's going to be from a, um, from Judaism, right? We're gonna to have to learn it from there instead of really learning from myself. And I think the other thing is the feast days being the plan of salvation of the most high, what it represents. I think it's 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 one of those things that it's a great blessing and a great truth that we can rejoice in. And I think we got robbed of when it comes to, you know, knowing this particular information and trying to set ourselves apart. Now that being said, you're going to have some nay naysayers come along and they're going to say, hey, well, you know, we're not in Jerusalem. We're not in the temple. We're not in this. We're not in that. We can't do this. We can't do that. And they're going to just try to explain it away. Right. But the feast days is when we as we go through it, it's really one of those things where we rehearse the matter. You know how here, you know, in the West, they like to do like a civil war reenactment and stuff like that. It's the same thing that that we do. Right. It's the same thing. We, we will try to memorialize these feast days. We're basically going to the family reunion of Yah and, and, and wearing the T-shirt. We're saying that, hey, I am with you. I'm one of yours. I'm one of the children of the most high. Yah, right. And so that's what you're doing. You're, you're just kind of rehearsing the matter. Are you able to do it perfectly? No, we're not able to. Right. But we do want to at least rehearse the matter. We are just proving and showing to our Messiah. We're showing him, OK, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, pick me, you know, so to speak. It's one of those things that we want to keep that we want to keep in mind. And for those of you who don't really understand these feast days, you, you, you're in for a treat. You're, you're going to understand like, oh, now it all makes sense. So right now we're going to do the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is the day of salvation, the day he comes to collect. Right. So that that's one of the things that we want to look for. It's kind of like uh, if we want to do it on an earthly. It's kind of like Passover was putting you on a level. He paid the price. Put you on well, that way he comes back to uh, collect. I know that's kind of an antiquated uh, concept these days. There's no really a such thing as layaway that much. You know, uh, it's very rare now. But that's one of those things. You know, you just pay for it, and you know, you make your payments and all that, and then you know, you pick it up when it's all complete and stuff like that. But that's that's not the case uh, for this because he's paid the full price. OK, it's just that he's coming to collect, which is his second return. But if I want to go ahead and give you an idea. Let me give you an idea of these feast days. If we look at the Passover, OK, it happens in the spring. It's newness. It's brand new. It's birth or rebirth. You know, um, it's him or the Messiah, the Mashiach. He is paying for our sin, paying for our sins and kind of in a way of making an atonement. He's paying for our sins and that debt, you know, has been ran up. We, we, we maxed out. OK, <laughs> on sins, we maxed out. So he paid for that so that we can have an opportunity, a chance to be reconciled back to the father, to be reconciled to the father. Right. And it took him a sinless, the lamb of God, a sinless lamb 
to pay that price, right? Because the blood of bulls and goats could never take away uh, those sins, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have to continually offer it year by year by year by year. But Christ, once and for all, obviously all that I just paraphrased, but Christ, once and for all, he did that, boom, he made that sacrifice once, is good enough, he's accepted of the Father, we're good to go in the Passover. Feast of unleavened bread, purge out the old leaven, Live, walk in the newness of life, be a different creature, you are a different creature in Christ purging out sin, purging out transgression, right? So that that right there, that's your unleavened bread, which follows the Passover immediately, right? Then, of course, after that, you're going to have, you know, Pentecost. That's when, obviously, one part of it is the Holy Ghost coming out, but it's also called the Feast of Weeks, okay? And so now um, the disciples, plus we are also imbued with power, okay? He gives us, you know, uh, all things are possible through Christ who strengthens us, right? So we want to keep that in mind. So we have our day of, uh, we, we have our Passover and we have unleavened bread and we have our Feast of Week, which is, you know, Pentecost, which simply means 50, okay? So it just means it's just 50. So we have that. These things come to us and, and we have to understand that they're truly, truly important. Then, of course, we have our Day of Atonement, which we will talk about. And then we'll have our Feast of Trumpets, tabernacles and then the close of tabernacles which we call the eighth day okay um trumpets is an announcement is a warning symbolizes that symbolizes in the grand scheme his arrival his coming okay it his coming in the year of jubilee what we believe whatever year that is i'm not telling you which year it is but whatever year that is that is the year of release that's the year of jubilee whenever that is right and then of course tabernacles when he dwells with us Okay, the thousand year millennial reign. And then the close of it, the eighth day, eternity, after the millennium, the eternity. So there you have it. You have our feast days laid out for us. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plan. And we, you and I, we just have to make sure that we are part of that plan. So let's go ahead and um, jump into the scriptures talking about atonement. So join me over in Corinthians 15. And we're going to read the first four verses of Corinthians. First Corinthians, actually. First Corinthians 15. First four verses. One reads this way. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For... I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get an idea. Some of, the, some of, some of these feast days, you know, they kind of run together, right? So we're going to look at that. So let's go on over to Leviticus 23. Let's go to Leviticus 23. And I'm starting verse 1 and then we'll jump around a bit. Okay? So Leviticus 23, verse 1, it says, it says this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord. So whose feasts are these? Concerning the feasts of the Lord. So when you hear that, oh, these are the feasts of the Jews. Now, that's not what the scripture says. These are the feasts of the Lord. Which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, gatherings, right? Even these are my feasts. These are his feasts. So you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for him. They don't belong to you. They belong to him. Okay? Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. See, notice he starts with the seven-day weekly Sabbath, right? From the world called Saturday. On holy, a holy convocation... And ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Interesting, right? And then he says, These are the feasts of the Lord's, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. All right? And so he's going to start going through the, uh, the feast days that I, I just mentioned, right? That I just summarized for you, right? But we're going to drop down to verse 26. Okay? 26 says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, uh, 
it's going to come up to where you guys, someone will ask if they've never done it before. They're going to ask, well, what does it mean to afflict your soul? I'll tell you now, but then I'll let it bear out in the scriptures. Affliction your soul, uh, a fast. You're setting aside a fast, okay? So on the Day of Atonement, you guys are watching this lesson or whatever. This may be the beginning of the Day of Atonement uh, uh, as you watch, but this is going to be a day of a fast, right? This is where you fast. So you adults, you get, you, you, you get, you get prepared for that, okay? You, you prepare yourself for it and you fast. Um, if you have little children, you have them fast about as long as they can, okay? Basically, you know, which means from sundown to sundown, okay? Sundown to sundown, you're, you're not gonna eat, okay? Sun goes down, boom, you don't eat uh, to the next time until the sun is down again, 24 hours. So you set aside a fast. Some people ask, well, you know, you have medication. If you're not able to do a fast because you have to have particular medications, then you do you have to do. Okay, I, 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 my opinion, and I don't think the Most High wants you to necessarily pass out because you are neglecting your uh, medications, right? So, we're going to go ahead and uh, keep going. It says, uh, it shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It says, and ye shall do no work in the same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not afflict in the same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Okay, this is how serious it was. And whatsoever soul it shall be that shall not afflict. Uh, let me see here. Uh, 30. I'm sorry. 30. And whatsoever soul it shall be that doeth any work in the same day, that same soul will I destroy from among his people. So, one, you have to set aside a fast. You have to afflict your soul and fast that day. And also, no working that day. Okay? Uh, destroy from among his people. Uh, ye, shall, uh, ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Okay? Throughout your generations, through all your dwellings. Okay? So, no, we're not in a, we're, we're not in our land, but can you set aside a fast even though we're here in the West? Can you fast? Right? So, 32. And it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your soul, or you shall fast, in the ninth day of the month of at even, at even, from even until even, ye shall celebrate your Sabbath. From night to night, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. So this is not a, a fast where we're just like, oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, I... No, it's not that. This is a celebration. This is a afflicting your soul. You'd be focusing on the Most High. You'd be focusing on the Ruach. You're focusing on the things of the Mashiach. This, 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 is, this is the opportunity that you use to focus on the things of the Most High, to clear your mind, to detox your body. You use this as that particular opportunity. This is the prescription he wants us to take, so this is, that's what we should do, okay? This is to benefit us. So, set aside a fast, prepare yourself. One of the things that may help you is that um, I, I fast once a week, so it's not going to be a big deal for me to fast for the Day of Atonement. Um, to work your way up, you fast uh, once a month or something, right? You or you and your family, you set aside a day. Okay, on this day, we're going to fast, okay? Uh, preferably a day where you don't have to work, but on an off day, just, just fast. to Kind of get into the practice of it, get into the hang of it. So let's just give that uh, a thought and give that a try, okay? So let's go to Isaiah 58. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. We're going to just read all of it. Isaiah 58. Cry loud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and a house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore, have we fasted, say, uh, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore, have we afflicted our souls? You see the parallel language there. Have we fasted? Have we afflicted our souls? Okay. And thou takest no knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. So you're, like, you're working, you're doing business, right? Behold. 
Ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with a fist of wickedness. And ye shall not fast as you do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Now you see the parallel language? Afflicting your soul, fasting, same thing, right? It is to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Would thou call this a fast and an acceptable day of the Lord? So basically you want to do the fast and do it how you want to do it. You want to still work. You want to still do all these other different things you want to do. You ain't focusing on the most high. You're not doing any good works or anything like that. You're just exacting your own pleasures. Okay. Is it not this? The fast that I have chosen, and then he gives you an idea of the things that he wants you to do. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heaven burdens, and to let the oppressed go free. And that ye break every yoke? He's asking the question. Verse 7. Is it not to deal bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh, your own family, right? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Okay, You're going to see, you, this way you see the Most High move in your life when you set a fast the way he said it, the way he prescribed it. It starts with two things. One, set a fast. You have the fast from evening to evening. And two, don't work. The other thing, these are the good works that I was talking about. Okay, those good works. Okay, he says, um, one of the good works is loose the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, that, and, and to break every yoke, that, that yoke of bondage, whatever that is, right? And that fast, this is a good time to like forgive somebody, owe you 30 bucks, you know, forgive that debt. If you someone who owes someone, pay it. It's a good time to pay it. Okay, don't vex your neighbor like that. So it's not, I'm not saying let everybody off the hook for what I'm saying, but you know, it's some of those things, right? Breaking, you know, the every yoke. Is it to deal bread to the hungry? Someone's hungry, feed them. Is that thou bring the poor that are cast out to your, the house? Okay, so you help someone who is poor and unfortunate. When thou seeketh to see the naked, to cover them. Someone is naked until you give them your cloak, right? Some charity right there. And thou that hide, not hide thyself from thy family. This, this, the, the, these are the things, these are the examples that he wants us to do. And then his glory shall be our reward. Verse 9. Then thou, then shall thou call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, he shall say, here am I. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth the finger and speaking vanity, the putting forth the finger, the point and blame. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday, if you do this right. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a water garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places thou shalt Raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thy own ways, nor finding thy own pleasure, nor speaking thy own words, then shall he, thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. If we just learn to do this the right way. That's, 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 that's all we have to do. We have to learn to do this the right way. Set a fast at the appointed time fast and get off work and then from there you do these good works that was just outlined in Isaiah 58 Isaiah 58 do those things that are outlined here and then you'll be well on your way 
And then he fulfilled his promise. You do your part of the deal, he does his part of the deal. But right now we need to get into practice. We have to practice righteousness. Remember, we got pretty good at sin. We, oh, 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 we're the type of butter muffins who become experts at sin. A lot of us PhDs. But now, let's make a practice of righteousness. Step by step. You do not have to jump a chasm, a great gulp fix. You don't have to jump the Grand Canyon um, to, to feel like you're making progress on a path of righteousness. Little things, can you set aside a fast? Can you afflict your soul? Can you do that? And then, if Yah willing, if Yah keeps breath in your body till the next, then you do a little something else. Then you add something else, add something else. Do another good work, then another good work, then another good work. Make a practice of righteousness. Make a practice of obedience. Let's continue. We're going to go to Acts 27. Okay? Because some people say, oh, well, it's done away. We don't have to do that. You know, new I'll, I'll just read one line. One line. One line. Acts 27 and 9. Acts 27 and 9. It says, now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast, not a fast, the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them, right? The fast, the fast. Oh, well, you know, they're Jews or whatever. Okay, follow me as I follow Christ. Christ did all this. Don't listen to this, it's done away crap, okay? This is a fast. You don't have to be in Jerusalem to fast. You can just fast. That's all you have to do. We're not going to make this harder than it has to be. Think not that he's come to destroy the law. Leviticus 16. Let's look at Leviticus 16. And we're going to jump around a little bit too. And I'll tell you where I am. But we're going to do Leviticus 16. We're going to jump around a little bit. But let's look at 16. And I'm going to start. I'm going to jump over to uh, verse 29. Okay. Verse 29. It says, and, it sh and this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls. Hmm. And do no work at all. Will there be one of your own country or stranger that sojourn among you? So it don't matter who it is, right? For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Okay? It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you and you shall afflict your soul by statute forever. For how long? Forever. For how long? Forever. Every year he asks you to take one day off from eating. Is that too much to ask? Let's drive down to verse 6. Let's see what did they do to uh, you know, put together this uh, sacrifice, right? Verse 6, it says, And Aaron, or Aharon, shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the, Lord, the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement for him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So this is symbolizing that the goat, one goat, basically, um, he's going to offer as a sacrifice. And the other goat is a symbolizer of placing your sins on that goat and then letting him run away with your sins into the wilderness. He is carrying away your sins. All right. So that's so that's what we want to do. Now you don't want to. You can't just chop up one goat and then the Most High resurrects him and all that. Okay, just he just took two goats. Okay, even though he could. I mean, he could resurrect the goat if he wants to. I'm not saying he can't, but he chose not to do that. Okay, he didn't want to. You know, he didn't want Aaron to chop up goats and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden put you know put it back together, and he didn't want to do that. Okay, so this is how he chose to do it. So one goat 
is 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 made you know for the low for for the sin offering and the other goat is for the scapegoat which the sins of the people are placed on the goat and that goat is released out into the wilderness to carry away your sins does it make sense let's drop down to 15. 15 it says then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. OK, so he's, you know, they built a tabernacle and one is the mercy seat and kind of symbolize, you know, the seat or the throne of the most high. And he's just sprinkling blood on it and stuff like that. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out. And have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. 18. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his fingers seven times and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Now this is the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both hands upon uh, hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. You guys, you, you saw you guys understanding. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Okay, so this is this this is what I explained before, so I won't do it again, but this is what we're talking about here. Okay, you have a goat that needed to be sacrificed, and another goat to carry away the sins. With that, let's go over to the New Testament or Brit Hadashah. And we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm sorry, verse 1. I'll jump around a little bit, but I'll let you know where I am. Hebrews 9. Uh, verse 1, it says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Let's drop down to six. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. We just read that, right? The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the whole holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscious meaning that you know the priest did have sin but he had to be cleansed he had to offer a sacrifice for himself first and for his home and all that which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle himself, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, right? So he's not, you guys get it. 12. Not about a blood of goats and calves. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Praise Yah. 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of and heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, 
purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, so he got you off the, the sacrificial system. Is what he talked about. He got, kind of got you off that system um, on that to where you don't, you know, where where you don't have to offer up, you know, sacrifices, that type of thing. You don't have to keep offering up the sacrifices because you have to keep doing it year by year. I mean, I mean, obviously there are sacrifices that were done every every week, every, you know, every other day or whatever. But you don't have to do this one because you have a more perfect sacrifice, right? A human committed to sins and a human, you know, the Messiah coming into in the form of a human, made himself a little lower than the angels. A human died. This was a perfect human, though. This was a spotless, sinless Lamb of God human who did it. And so he says, so if 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 bloods of goats and calves and stuff was that if that was accepted as an eternal redemption for us, how much more the Messiah? Let's drop to 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. That's that's true. Without and without shedding of blood is no remission of sin. Right. Everything done has got to be shed with blood. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be pur purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ does not enter into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. So he didn't just go into just a temple, you know, just a, a regular old temple or whatever. No, he ascended up to the Father, to the heavenly realm. Okay? When it was Aaron... You know, Aaron and his sons and the high priest, the, the Levites, when they did it, they went to the earthly tabernacle, right? Sometimes, obviously, the presence of God showed up, but when it comes to the Messiah, he went up, all right? You follow me? All right, <clears throat> 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must... He often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation the second time he's going to do it uh the second time for us without sin unto salvation we will be cleansed we will be cleansed that's the beauty of this if someone would just simply would have explained this to us years ago we'd be so far ahead. we could be so far ahead in the game in our understanding Romans 5. Join me over in Romans 5. We're going to read 6 through 11. Romans 5, 6 through 11. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man, man will one die. Yet, peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so. But we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now we just we receive the atonement. That's what we're talking about now. We're dealing with the day of atonement. We are recognizing, we are memorializing, and we are rehearsing the matter. Except we don't have to kill a bull or a goat. That part's already done for us. 
He did his part, and now it's time for us to do our part. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Because there's a purpose to all this. There's a purpose to why, you know, we have to do it this way. There's a purpose to why we have to prepare ourselves. There's a purpose, and we've already alluded to that. 1 Thessalonians, we're going to read 9 and 10. 9 says this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath of to come so we're going to talk about the wrath to come this is this this, this is the reason why we're doing this. this is the reason why we are rehearsing the matter this is the reason why we're observing this because we are preparing preparing us for what's to come that's why we do these type of things he'll he'll, he'll give us practical things in this case it's a fast but he'll give us practical things to to do so that we can understand the heavenly question is will we do it we see it we see we've seen it before we see it um you guys remember whether depending on your generation if you're the older generation you remember an eight you know in the 80s i believe you know karate kid wax on wax off and we remember um with little Jaden smith okay just what 10 10 years 10 years or so ago okay a little over a decade ago 20 years ago um, we have uh Jaden and his put the jacket on take the jacket off right we're doing these mundane things in order to teach us something else. And that's what the Most High does for us. He'll have us do something. It may not make sense. Plenty of time we look at the Bible and we're just like, oh, why we gotta do that? I mean, what's to, I don't understand. I, I, yeah, you may not understand. You may not understand, but there's a purpose. And there's a purpose even if you don't get it. Even if I don't get it, I know there's a purpose behind it. You want all the answers? Then make it into the kingdom and ask him all you want. Hallelujah. So, let's go to Revelation 6. Revelation 6. Talking about the wrath to come, all right? Let's go to Revelation 6. I'm going to start over in verse 12. Revelation 6, verse 12. Verse 12 says this, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casted her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Wrath is coming. And when we cover ourselves in his blood, when we put ourselves back in covenant, when we rehearse the matter, when we practice righteousness, We, we're saving ourselves from the wrath to come when we do these things. This is, how, this is how we do it. This is why the apostles and the prophets, this is why they tell us these things. This is how you identify yourself as one of him, that where you and I can be spared from the wrath to come. Let's look at Revelation chapter 11. Let's look at that real quick. Revelation chapter 11, we're going to go at 15. We're going to read 15 and 18. Now look at this. Look what it says. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, 
And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And drop to 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, again with the wrath, in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, hmm, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Wrath, my friend, is coming. Wrath is coming. And, and, and it's not to scare you, it's to prepare you. This covers you so that you can be spared from the wrath. He's not going to slay those that are his, those that are in covenant with him. He's not going to destroy them. He's going to destroy those who are not with him, who are not on his team, who will not sign up for his program. Those are the ones he's going to come to destroy. Let's go to Matthew 24. We're going to see when it all starts, when it starts, right? It starts to unfold way back in the first century. It starts to unfold and it's still unfolding, still unfolding. We've seen a lot of, a lot of bad, bad, bad things that's happened over the past 2,000 years. Ken, would you agree with me that a lot of bad things has happened over the last 2,000 years? Okay, and like birth planes, it's going to get worse before this epic crescendo that will culminate in the battle of Armageddon. And then of course we got a couple other things that happens after that. But after Armageddon is over, a lot of that war and bloodshed and all the, most of that's, that's gonna be gone because you walk into the millennial reign. So most of all the, that ep, this epic, you know, this, this epic violent blood, you know, up to the horse's bridle, all that's gonna be, that's, after Armageddon, that you, we won't have that much. You won't have that. You won't have that. You know, you might get a rebel here and there that gets smited or whatever, you know, because there'll still be humans and uh, regular flesh, you know, mortals in the millennial reign. And, you know, some of them might get, you know, might get a little cute and mess around and find out. And they'll get dealt with, but it won't be like in, in, in Armageddon. Okay, it won't be like that. There's, you know, there'll be, there'll be a, a few, you know, butter muffins out there who, who, who think they know better. And yeah, it's just not going to work out for him. But let's look at the beginning of it. Just a little bit. Matthew 24. I'm going to start it over with 29. Matthew 24. Verse 29 says this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is him coming, right? And then what? And he said, and he shall send his angels with the sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. From all directions, right? This great, <laughs> this great sifting out is going to happen. I just want you to be prepared. He's coming to separate the wheat from the tares. I, just, I, I, I want you to be a wheat. I want you to be on his right hand. I just want to prepare you. So when you see these things happening out in the world, you're not so soon shaken. That all of a sudden in those moments that your faith increases in those moments rather than diminish. Join me over uh, Isaiah 13. Let's look at this. Isaiah 13. And uh, let's see here. We're going to start at verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. He's going to destroy the sinners. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. 
and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophar. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and earth shall remove out of her place and in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And it shall be as a chaste roll and as a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one into his own land. It's 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 gonna get serious that day, brothers and sisters. It's gonna get scary. It's gonna get quite scary for a lot of people. Join me over to in Leviticus. Join me over in Leviticus. And we're gonna to go to Leviticus 25, I wanna read eight through 10, okay? So we're gonna look at this one, uh, eight through 10. Eight says this, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years, okay, not weeks, of years, unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of these seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto you, for uh, the unto thee forty and nine years, like forty nine years, right? Then shall thy cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall he make the trumpet sound throughout all the land. Okay, and you shall hollow the fiftieth year. Now we're at the fiftieth year, right? This is the year of release, the year of jubilee, right? And proclaim the liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. All this, 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 this working, this striving, this toil, all of this, it ends in the year of jubilee. As it pertains to this particular story at this particular time, you know, people were indentured servants you know they had a debt they had to work off that debt but in the 50th year it happened to be the 50th year of the year of jubilee he that person is released that's why it says return unto their family so this is not a slave this is people having a job right there's, there's no downtown at this time there was no downtown okay it could be a marketplace here and there but there's no downtown and all this other stuff right so when someone had a debt, they may have sold themselves into an indentured service. Say, okay, I'll work for you for five years, seven years, three years, whatever. But it, it, if it comes to year of Jubilee, it's set free. As it pertains to us, we believe that this is the year that the Most High, will, the Messiah, the Messiah, not the Most High Father, but this Messiah shall return. Now, I can't tell you which year. I don't know. But whatever that year it is, that's, that's the year of Jubilee. Resurrections are happening. War is going to happen. Of course, we know who's the winner of that. Going into the, uh, you know, going into the millennial reign and all that. It's the year of Jubilee, that release coming out. The sea shall give up its dead and the grave shall give up their dead. And all, all that's happening in that year. Whatever year that is. Year of release. Year of liberty. Job say, you know, uh, and, and I should see him... Um, as he is, you know, it would be the same thing to glorify bodies, glorify bodies. You're free from death. Jubilee. Let's go to first Corinthians. We we're talking about those, you know, live goats and all that other stuff. Let's, let's look at this real quick. First Corinthians 15. And we'll jump around. Starting in verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received and wherein ye stand. By which also you are saved if you keep in memory that, I mean, what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Drop down to 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how some say among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. Okay. Keep in mind, you know, the two goat, live goat, scapegoat and all that stuff. 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, meaning for nothing. And your faith is also vain, or for nothing. You're believing for nothing, if he's not risen. 
yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so, be that the dead rise not. See, so if Christ not raised up, then everyone remains in their graves. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Yea, are yet in your sins. Just you still have to bear your own sins if he's not raised up, right? Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. I mean, the guys who, even the people who die believing in him, they're gone too. They, you just forget it. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But now if Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. We're going to drop down to uh, verse uh, 51. Let's drop down to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. One of the things I want you guys to remember is that we have to get past death in order to be saved. And this atonement is a part of that process and we cannot skip the process. Recognizing and understanding that the Messiah is our atonement. Yes, he's our Passover. He did pay the price. When he died, that part happened. Okay. The payment has been made. The atonement is, uh, he's accepted. The atonement has been accepted. We're just waiting him for, for him to come back and collect. And we want to be collected, gathered unto him. Not raptured. I'm not even alluding to a rapture, right? Not, we're not doing that. But we do want to be with him, be gathered and be caught up with him. And where he be, <laughs> that we may be also. Right? I know how it, I know it sounds funny. So... Brothers and sisters, I just want you guys to understand that these feast days are critically important to our understanding of how we're going to be saved. And the Israelites were commanded to do certain little things, things that seemed, you know, a little weird or seemed a little archaic, but they had to do it. In some respects, it may have seemed barbaric. Not in my estimation. I don't think it was barbaric at all. But, you know, they had to slay animals and shed blood and all these other things. They had to clean this, cleanse that. And I, I get it. Priests had to wear certain garments, build his tabernacle. There's an outer, then there's an inner, the holy most holy. I get it. I understand. But this is the prescription. This is what the most high wanted us to do. This is what that needed to take place. And it was critically important that we follow these instructions. Now, I understand we can't do that perfectly at this point. I get it. But you can rehearse the matter. And it's something as easy as setting aside a fast. That's a simple feast day to keep for most. Because there's really only two things you have to do. And that is take off from work and fast. Very simple. You don't need to gather together. You don't have to do, you don't have to do all that for this one. Not this one. We want to keep it very, very simple, very, very practical. Now, if you want to do the other good works, help someone out, feed the poor, things like that, go for it. It's described in um, Isaiah 58, so go for it. I'm not going to tell you not to do that. Most High himself was through, through the prophet Isaiah saying, well, why don't you do these things? <laughs> and then I'm going to bless you. Then if you call me, I'll hear from you and I'll say, here I am. So I'm certainly, I'm certainly going to suggest do any, anything that pleases the Most High. I'm all for it. I'm telling you to do it. 
Okay, so this has been the Day of Atonement. I appreciate all you guys uh, for inviting me into your home. I hope someone has been edified by this particular lesson. So, until next time, search the scriptures, improve all things. Shalom, Israel.